Jamie Bailey works as a peer recovery support specialist for Project Vida, which is a fully integrated, federally qualified healthcare clinic located in El Paso, Texas. A border town, El Paso has a predominantly Hispanic and bilingual population. Ms. Bailey provides services in both Spanish and English, primarily serving individuals with substance use disorder and co-occurring mental and substance use disorders. She works with Project Vida physicians, counselors, psychiatrists, and psychiatric nurse practitioners to address each individual's total health needs. As a peer recovery support specialist, she approaches each individual with a recovery-oriented, reality-centered conversation about her status in long-term recovery and uses motivational interviewing techniques to move that person along states of change. She is receiving advanced training using culturally responsive interventions for Spanish-speaking people. Ms. Bailey previously worked for Project Esteem, a core program that helps sex trafficking survivors and sex workers who had substance use problems. Please help me welcome Jamie Bailey. Thank you, everyone. Um, good morning. My name is Jamie Enchinton Bailey, and I am a Latina woman in long-term recovery from substance use disorder and other mental health issues. And what this means to me is that I have not had a drink of alcohol or used any mind-altering substances since August 27th of 2012. Through the work I've done, thank you. Thank you. Through the work I've done on myself in recovery, I have been given an opportunity at a meaningful and purposeful life that I never imagined possible when I was in the grips of my addiction. I'm a first generation American. My parents were both Mexican immigrants who came to this country in search of a better life for themselves and their children. Today I'm able to honor the many sacrifices that my immigrant parents made and to use my experience, strength, and hope as a person with substance use disorder and other mental health issues to help others in my comunidad living with those same issues find recovery as a peer recovery support specialist for Project Vida. I provide peer recovery support services in El Paso, Texas. El Paso is a border city on the frontera of Mexico and the United States. 81.4% of our population is Latinx. Chicana author Gloria Anzaldúa described the U.S.-Mexican border as una herida abierta, an open wound, where the third world grates against the first and bleeds. And before a scab forms, again, sorry, and before a scab forms, it hemorrhages again, the lifeblood of two worlds merging to form a third country, a border culture. She said that a borderland is a vague and undetermined place created by the emotional residue of an unnatural boundary. Researchers have found that the U.S. border region is a highly disadvantaged area, characterized by high rates of poverty with low rates of education and employment, and is economically interdependent with Mexico. A study which examined whether the border is a risk environment for alcohol and drug problems and the role of border proximity and variables related to crossing the border and substance use <laughs> found that the prevalence of alcohol use disorders was greater among those living at the border compared to the interior side of the study, with co-occurring co hazardous alcohol and drug use also more common among those living at the border compared with the interior. This was the environment in which my addiction and my recovery were initiated. As a member of the Latinx community, I have firsthand experience of the disparities that our people face as we seek recovery from substance use disorder, including cultural values, poverty, lack of housing and educational opportunities, and stigma, both internal and external. I'm also uniquely aware of the strength of our communities and our families when we rise up together to help and support one another. I will speak to you today about peer recovery support services and their practical application, recovery, and some of the disparities faced by Latinx individuals, families, and communities as they initiate and sustain recovery, and finally, features of culturally competent peer recovery support services. Uh, Dr. Hector already introduced uh, SAMHSA State Targeted Response Te Technical Assistance Grant, which created the Opioid Response Network, 
to assist uh, state targeted response grantees, individuals, and other organizations. Technical assistance is available to support the evidence based prevention, treatment, and recovery of opioid use disorders. Um, the Opioid Response Network provides local experienced consultants in prevention, treatment, and recovery to communities and organizations to help address our opioid crisis. Slide. Um, to ask questions or submit a TA request, please visit their website, email them, or you can also call them. Peer-based recovery support is the process of giving and receiving non-professional, non-clinical assistance to achieve long-term recovery from alcohol and or other, other drug-related problems. Peer-based recovery support is provided by people who are experientially credentialed, and what that means is they have lived experience with addiction and recovery, and they're certified through state boards and national certification aid entities. Peer-based recovery support can be delivered through a variety of organiz organizational venues and a variety of service roles, including paid and volunteer recovery support specialists. The governance structures of peer-based recovery support can vary in the span and degree of peer control, for example, peer-owned, peer-directed, and peer-delivered. I will briefly discuss the types of support and job duties associated with peer recovery support. Peer recovery support specialists offer emotional, informational, instrumental, and affiliational support. Emotional support is demonstrated through empathy, caring, or concern in order to bolster a person's self-esteem and confidence. Service delivery can include peer mentoring or peer-led support groups. Informational support includes the sharing of knowledge and information and or providing life or vocational skills training. Instrumental support can entail providing concrete assistance to help others accomplish tasks such as finding childcare or helping to access community health and social services. Affiliational support is given by facilitating contacts with other people to promote learning of social and recreational skills, creating community and acquiring a sense of belonging. Job duties of a peer recovery support specialist are varied and may include assertive outreach to identify those in need of recovery. This includes street outreach to individuals who are still using substances and the proliferation of harm reduction strategies. Peer support specialists may also perform a recovery capital needs assessment of individuals, families, and communities. They can provide recovery education and coaching for both individuals and families. We know that for Latinx communities, reaching out to families can be crucial, both for initiating recovery, but also maintaining it. Peer recovery support specialists also perform recovery resource identification, mapping, and development, including volunteer recruitment. They create assertive linkages to communities of recovery, including support groups and support institutions. They assist peers in providing our problem solving to eliminate obstacles to recovery. They perform recovery checkups, lead peer support groups, and serve as peer mentors as soon as recovery is initiated. For urban settings, peer recovery support specialists can develop a welcome slash recovery support center. In El Paso Recovery Alliance, a recovery community organization has opened up Punto de Partida, a drop-in center for individuals who are using opiates where they are provided fentanyl testing strips and Narcan and trained on how to respond to opiate overdose. Individuals are also provided access to peer recovery support services and coached through harm reduction and safer using strategies. They build strong linkages between levels of care through peer-based recovery support services and can provide screening and early intervention in primary care, child care, and school settings. Each Project Vida clinic and all of the schools in which we provide behavioral health services follow a screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment protocol. If an individual utilizing clinic and or behavioral health services is flagged as possibly having a substance use disorder, they are provided with a brief intervention by a peer recovery support specialist, and if appropriate, referral to treatment and or continued peer recovery support services. The key to peer recovery support success is long-term engagement. I work with individuals anywhere from two to five years. The role of the peer must grow and shift and remain relevant to the person 
as they maintain recovery and as they move along the stages of change. And this evolving role must be communicated to the recovery. Those with long-term histories of use, experiencing homelessness, and other factors that have deprived them of a full life benefit from the deepening of recovery capital and experiencing of new relationships. Recovery maintenance is often where traditional recovery supports become less intentional and connected to a person's journey. This journey remains fragile even after stabilization because life continues to happen. It is helpful to have a peer connected to multiple resources and community partners that can support and advocate for the recovery as needed. Slide. Oh wait, we're, yeah. Before, after that, please. After that. Yes. Before. before. <laughs> there, right there. Yeah. Okay. SAMHSA defines recovery as a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live self-directed lives, and strive to reach their full potential. Recovery is built on access to evidence-based clinical treatment and recovery support services for all populations. There are several aspects to this process of change, including health, home, purpose, and community. Slide. Health, home, purpose, and community are vital parts of the process of change that occurs as a person enters into and maintains recovery. Health is defined as overcoming or managing one's diseases or symptoms. For example, abstaining from the use of alcohol, illicit drugs, and other non-prescribed medications if one has an addiction problem. And for everyone in recovery, making informed, well, informed healthy choices that support physical and emotional well-being. Home refers to having a safe and stable place to live. Purpose is defined as having meaningful daily activities, such as a job, school, volunteerism, family caretaking, or creative endeavors, and the independence, income, and resources to participate in society. And finally, community refers to relationships and social networks that provide support, friendship, love, and hope. In the next several slides, I will discuss briefly just some of the disparities faced by Latinx communities in regards to the aspects of change. Disparity is important to discuss because as resource brokers, peer recovery support specialists providing support to Latinx people can serve to leverage their knowledge and resources in an attempt to counteract these disparities and connect them with agencies and services that are sensitive and responsive to cultural needs. I will also include a word on Latinx cultural values that can serve both as protective factors and strengths that help to initiate and, man and maintain recovery. Latinx communities face many health disparities. According to the CDC in 2001, Hispanics of all races experienced more age-adjusted years of potential life loss before the age of 75 years per 100,000 population than non-Hispanic whites for the following causes of death, stroke, chronic liver disease and cirrhosis, diabetes, HIV, and homicide. In 2000, Hispanics had higher age-adjusted incidences for cancers of the cervix and the stomach. We know that language can present a unique barrier for accessing health services for Latinx communities. Researchers have found that since 1980, the share of immigrants who are proficient in English, that means those who speak only English at home or who speak English at least very well, has declined, though it has increased slightly in recent years. This decline has been driven entirely by those who only speak English at home, which fell from 30% of immigrants ages five and older in 1980 to just 16% of immigrants in the year 2016. Among the nation's immigrants, Spanish is by far the most spoken non-English language, with 43% of immigrants saying that they speak Spanish at home. Beyond being able to offer services in Spanish, Spanish language proficiency is vital to accurately communicating critical information to clients and to meaningfully engage them in their own care. Emerging research has shown that linguistic proficiency is associated with engagement and treatment outcomes among Spanish-speaking Latinx people accessing health services. Limited Spanish language proficiency among providers creates barriers for Latinx clients to trust providers and to initially engage in services. Previous research indicates that Latinx people experience psychological health problems at rates similar to European Americans. However, research also 
demonstrates that Latinx people are often unlikely to seek psychological services and three times more likely to terminate services prematurely when compared to non-Latinx people receiving psychological services in the United States. Further research done on Latinx college students shows that they vastly underuse mental health services. Latinx cultural values which may be influencing help-seeking behaviors includes machismo, which stipulates that males must never show weakness. Several studies have found that stigma can affect an individual's willingness to seek help for mental health issues. It has been found that help-seeking attitudes can be directly affected by self-stigma, which in turn is influenced by public stigma awareness and endorsement of public stigma. Attitudes towards help-seeking are directly linked to self-stigma and intentions to pursue mental health services. Latinx populations often lack adequate understanding of the process of mental health services, and they fear discrimination and unfair treatment by mental health professionals. Latinx populations also face many disparities in being able to afford safe and stable housing, which can impact recovery. According to the National Low Income Housing Coalition, black, Native American, and Hispanic households are more likely than white households to be extremely low income renters with incomes at or below the poverty level. 16% of Hispanic households are extremely low income renters compared with only 6% of white non-Hispanic households who are extremely low income renters. This racial disparity is a result of higher homeownership rates and higher incomes among white households. Decades of racial discrimination in real estate lending practices and federal housing policies have made home ownership difficult to obtain for minorities. While overt discrimination has been outlawed by the Fair Housing Act, today's credit scoring system and lending practices continue as barriers to minority home ownership. Racial disparities in income are the result of historical and current discrimination and differences in educational attainment wages and employment rates, among other factors. The Latino Policy Forum states that despite the importance of quality, affordable housing in growing safe and stable communities, more than half of Latinx renters and homeowners struggle to meet housing costs. Many spend more than 30% of their incomes on housing expenses, an unsustainable burden on household income by industry standards. Given the disparity between income and housing costs, a growing number of Latinx families contend with foreclosure, homelessness, and unsustainable living arrangements with extended family, a practice commonly known as doubling up. Immigration status can also create a strain in many Latinx households. There were 12 million immigrants living in the country illegally as of January 2015, according to the most recent estimate from the Department of Homeland Security. According to researchers, Mexicans make up half of all unauthorized immigrants in 2016. Mexico is the country's largest source of immigrants with 26.6% of all U.S. immigrants coming from Mexico. Families in which one or more members are undocumented, undocumented immigrants experience unique hardships. Results of a study suggest that hindered parental involvement might be a stressor and a risk factor for substance use and cigarette use among adolescents growing up in families with undocumented members. There are numerous disparities that affect Latinx people in regards to being able to meaningfully engage and participate in society and having the independence, income, and resources to do so, including poverty and incarceration. Researchers have found that since 1970, the poverty rate has remained largely unchanged among Hispanics, but has declined among non-Hispanic whites and blacks, particularly before the onset of the recent recession. The influx of large numbers of immigrants partially explains why poverty rates have not fallen among Hispanics. In 2009, Hispanics were more than twice as likely to be poor than non-Hispanic whites. Lower average English ability, low levels of educational attainment, part-time employment, and the youthfulness of Hispanic household heads in addition to the 2007-2009 economic recession are important factors that have pushed up the Hispanic poverty rate relative 
to non-Hispanic whites. In addition, income equality is greater among Hispanics than among non-Hispanic whites. Income equality is lower among foreign-born Hispanics than among Hispanic natives. According to the Prison Policy Initiative, Latinx people are incarcerated at a rate about two times higher than non-Latinx whites, but prisons are disproportionately located in non-Latinx areas. This combination has tremendous implications for the prison system's ability to hire appropriate numbers of Latinx staff. The Prison Policy Initiative found that in 2010, there were 20 counties spread across 10 states where the Latinx population that was incarcerated outnumbered those who were free. They also discovered a substantial number of counties where the incarcerated populations are largely Latinx, but where Latinx people are only a very small portion of the county's non-incarcerated population. A discussion on disparity should be balanced with an examination of strengths, and the Latinx community is replete with them. I'm going to briefly examine two cultural values which can be sources of strength and harnessed to assist in initiating recovery as well as in maintaining it. In social science literature, machismo typically refers to a constellation of ideological and behavioral traits exhibited and valued by Latino men. Machismo refers to hyper-masculine aspects which emphasize fearlessness, control, dominance, sexual prowess, and aggression. Traditionally, machismo is thought of as a comprehensive cultural model of street masculinity, a set of ideologies and behaviors that include drug use, aggression, and survival strategies. In its, exa in its exaggerated form, it includes fighting, drinking, performing daring deeds, seducing women, and bragging about these escapades. Males within the Latinx community are often taught the standards of being machista, which is also positively identified or associated with being the providers, protectors, and defenders of their families. This cultural value can be redirected in recovery to promote the idea of a strong man whose recovery allows him to be present for his family, helping to provide and protect them. I have worked with countless Latino men who voice the desire to recover from substance use disorder in large part because they want to reestablish themselves as the heads of their families and identify as a strong, sober man who can defend and protect their families. Having an awareness of this cultural value and utilizing it in service delivery can be a tremendous asset. Latinx people often hold high importance on collectivist values, such that family comes before the individual. Familismo, or familism, is an important cultural value among Latinx people, and it is the normative belief that family is central to the individual and that family has important obligations in regards to the provision of material, financial, and emotional support for both immediate and extended family members. Such belonging institutes a level of cohesiveness that provides a feeling of safety and mitigates feelings of loneliness and isolation. Familismo has been found to be protective against maladaptive behaviors that may result from stress and the acculturation process. For example, in a study including 150 parent and youth dyads, familismo was protective against depression for parents and depression and anxiety for youth. Recently, research has also documented that family support, an important component of familismo, is protective against substance use disorder, violence, HIV, and depression. I wanted to include a look at the guiding principles of recovery so that we can communicate them and embody them in our delivery of service. Hope is a belief that people do recover and that change is possible. We must maintain an optimistic attitude. Recovery is person-driven. We respect and honor people as autonomous. Self-determination and self-direction are the foundations of recovery. There are many pathways to recovery. Individuals are unique with distinct needs, strengths, preferences, goals, culture, and backgrounds, including trauma experience. Within Latinx communities, the disparities faced can result in traumatic experiences. Recovery is holistic. Recovery encompasses an individual's whole life, including mind, body, spirit, and community. 
Recovery utilizes peer support, including the sharing of experiential knowledge and skills, as well as social learning, which plays an invaluable role in recovery. Peer recovery support specialists show others that it can be done, that recovery is achievable. Recovery is relational. An important factor in the recovery process is the presence and involvement of people who believe in the person's ability to recover, who offer hope, support, and encouragement, and who also suggest strategies and resources for change. Recovery is strengths-based. Individuals, families, and communities have strengths and resources that serve as a foundation for recover, recovery. In addition, individuals have a personal responsibility for their own self-care and journeys of recovery. Recovery includes and honors culture and cultural backgrounds in all of its diverse representations, including values, traditions, and beliefs. Cultural identification is key in determining a person's journey and unique pathway to recovery. Recovery addresses trauma. The experience of trauma, including poverty, incarceration, and family separation, is often a precursor to or associated with alcohol and drug use, mental health problems, and related issues. Recovery is rooted in respect and includes community systems and societal acceptance and appreciation for people affected by mental health and substance use problems, including protecting their rights and eliminating di discrimination. Finally, we will identify characteristics of culturally competent peer recovery support services. Cultural competence and cultural humility means that we understand that we always have more to learn about other subcultures and groups. We are willing to identify and work through our own biases and prejudices, are willing to recognize and change our intentional and unintentional discriminatory behavior, are comfortable with culture and other differences between ourselves and our peers, and understand that people across cultures have different ways of viewing emotional distress and how to deal with it. Cultural competence and humility means that we communicate appropriately using verbal and nonverbal strategies, that we see peers' strengths and problems within the context of their culture, age, gender, sexual orientation, and other characteristics. We accept culturally indigenous forms of treatment when peers talk about or want to use them, and we identify barriers that may prevent diverse people from using peer support and self-help. In closing, Recovery is a journey which is filled with hope and healing for individuals, families, and communities. Foundational to peer recovery support services is the belief that as people in recovery, we have an expertise which is experiential, that we are able to transform one of the most difficult events in our lives, our battle against addic addiction, into a life of meaning and purpose and assist others living with substance use disorders in achieving purposeful, meaningful, and self-directed lives in recovery. It is important to note how disparities and any subsequent resulting trauma can contribute to the development of addictive behaviors within certain cultural groups. And it is equally important to be aware of the resiliency and strength contained within a person's cultural identity that can be harnessed and utilized to initiate and sustain recovery. As service providers, we seek to impart the message that recovery is possible, I myself am living proof of that. Thank you for your time and for the opportunity to speak on this important topic. Do you guys have any questions? <laughs> any questions? No. I have a question about this. You mentioned the housing situation, and that's something that we deal with. I mean, mm -hmm. my organization owns a lot of buildings around. The problem is, once the housing is increasing in price, the so maintenance increasing in the area, mm -hmm. taxes go up, but we cannot charge more those families because it's affordable care housing. Mm -hmm. So wow, it's, it's, we, uh, and in my mind, I'm dealing with a lot of issues, right? Because mm -hmm. people put, put money, the state put money to create this community-based neighborhood, right? We create the buildings, there are beautiful buildings around it, but then the gentrification happened, exactly. right, around it, and then you have people bidding to buy these buildings again. Mm -hmm. So how you protect 
these families, because what we're seeing is whoever was the first stake put in the money for that 10 years later, they want to sell the project, right? And then we're pushing back those families to the north mm -hmm. or to the south where they already have a family and a community created. Does that make sense? I mean, it's like it's hard in Philadelphia to keep, keep paying 600 bucks a month mm -hmm. for an apartment that around houses are being being sell for one million, mm -hmm. right? I don't have an answer, but I think that's something that we're dealing. Yes. There is no such a thing as affordable housing in the United States anymore. No, I think I, we're seeing that a lot in El Paso too, and and you mentioned gentrification, which is one of the root causes of. Can you use the mic? Oh yes. <laughs> you mentioned one of the root causes of the issue that you that you identified or the problem, which is gentrification, and we're seeing that a lot in El Paso, in one neighborhood in particular called Duranguito, where a lot of um, elderly people live, and so that that is the issue, and that's what we've been trying to address, which is gentrification. Um, the root causes of of uh, issues and disparities in housing have a lot to do with. Uh, poverty and educational attainment. So I don't think there's any one uh, solution to that problem. But again, it's just trying doing what what you already do, which is um, prevention, working with youth, trying to advance education. It's it's a very like multifaceted problem. And I don't think there's any one particular solution. Then ten years later because that school is doing great and getting good grades. Caucasians, other right. people with influence want to put the kid there. And now it's the opposite. Now the 80% the of Hispanic low income, now it's a 10% mm -hmm. on those schools. And yeah. you create most around that school. So that school has a lot of value now. And now it's 10% Hispanic. We lost, well, the, the idea, right, the vision mm -hmm. of that. Oh, there is no way of protecting that in a universe that is only thinking about money. Right. right? Mm -hmm. the, the capitalist. Yeah. I don't know, I put in that question out there. I know, I'm like. It's like a, yeah. We're all thinking it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's tough, it's tough. Yeah, I see it every day. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Um, we're all, I'm also part of an initiative to try to get more diverse people into the workforce for behavioral health, substance use, mm -hmm. and mental health. Mm -hmm. As a person who's been through it all, mm -hmm. what prompted you to want to work in this field? Can as a peer? Or repeat the question. Yeah. Sure. I don't know if this one works. My question is, uh, as a person that's been through it and recovered, what prompted you to want to work in the field? What what led you to this to, to this path that you're on? Um, for me personally, I had a lot of job experiences where I was helping or serving people. I was a yoga teacher. I worked for the Boys and Girls Club of America. This was all while I was still in my active addiction, and I I noticed that my sense of living a meaningful and purposeful life was uh, really magnified when I was being of service to people. And and there's a sense when you enter into recovery, I think, that you have to pay it forward or, or give back what was given to you. And, and that was really the impetus for me. Um, in Texas, there's a program now within the prisons to provide training for people to work as peers. So they, they are given half the training while they're incarcerated. And then when they get out, we finish training them. Um, I work at a residential recovery center, and most of the peers I work with voice that desire that they want to be peers. And so in the state of Texas, the requirements to be a peer are two years of sustained recovery, and then you receive training and certification through the state. Um, but I think that's something that a lot of people in recovery want to do. I hear that a lot. Yes. Can you talk... Is it on? <laughs> Can you talk about how your model um, of peer support works with or not 12-step programs? In the city that I live in, um, most of the recovery support there is 12-step 12 12 based. Um, 
there can be different barriers for that. Um, people who are agnostic, for example, might not, they might get turned off by the spiritual or religious aspects of the program. Um, smart recovery is available to those individuals. I host refuge recovery meetings, which are more mindful, mindfulness-based. Um, something that Punto de Partida has done, which is the opioid uh, drop-in center that I talked about, um, they host MARA meetings, which are medication-assisted recovery anonymous. And so we, we try to be very um, open to all pathways of recovery. Um, I do see a lot of value in recovery communities to instill a sense of belonging and providing social support. Um, in our um, indigenous groups in El Paso, um, there's white bison recovery. So I try to be very inclusive and include all pathways. But for the most part, 12-step um, groups are very open to peer support. And a lot of the peers that I work with uh, my colleagues are people that practice a 12-step model of recovery. How is um, reimbursement for the peers structured in Texas? Um, in Texas, as of January of this year, we're able to bill Medicaid as peer supports. That was something that had to go through the Texas de uh, Senate, and there was a lot of legislation um, that had to, you know, pass. It's not really the reimbursement rate is something really dismal. So we we don't. My organization um, doesn't bill Medicaid. We look more for grants. We have a SAMHSA grant that we use to provide services, um, peer services. But I think it, it varies. I don't know if Minnesota has reimbursement for peers. Yes, what are your, rate, are your rates? Um, it's not bad, but it's not great. Yeah. Ours was $1. How much? A dollar. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So there, yeah, that's that's what Project V. That was like, no, it's okay. So we we look for a lot of grants, and luckily we're able to find them. Yes. <laughs> As a, um, I don't know if you you do this in El Paso or other places, but in Minnesota, there's a uh, in, with the native within the native community, there's a group called Sober Squad. Have you heard of them? Okay, a lot of Sober Squad members become peer recovery specialists. They become certified to be peer recovery specialists. So I just wanted to put that out there that that's happened. There's like 3,800 members that started small in Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe and has branched out to a lot of the other reservations. What, what do they do, the Sober Squad? They, they do like a lot of the 12-step programming oh, okay. and they support each other in real good ways and they do sober things together. Oh, okay. Yeah, and they do the peer recovery they take people to court, take people to the to their appointments, that kind of thing. Oh, that's really interesting. No, we don't have anything like that um, in El Paso. What we do have in the state of Texas, in every uh, UT school, is a collegiate recovery program, which I'm involved with. Um, and it's you know college students, and they do sober activities and support one another. But I'm going to look into that. That sounds very interesting. Texas, uh, Texas. Um, I work for Clues. I'm the manager of chemical health. And one of the things is I have um, clients who are in recovery for a long time and they want to help the community and part of, and we have the peer uh, recovery specialist. Um, here are the requirements, you know, they have to take the courses, they have to get certified, but a lot of our, my clients don't read or write, first of all, in Spanish, and then they have to go through you know, all this, and they want to be part of the community. What do you, you guys do in Texas to help support those um, who want to be peer support specialists but can't? Um, and plus money-wise, because also it's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, so how, what do you guys do in Texas in order to support those? I'm one of two um, trainers in El Paso for peers, and... You know, the, I don't know what it's like in Minnesota, but the state has mandated a certain fee for the training. And I will often waive that for people, provide a lot of scholarships, especially people that are, are recently um, coming out of the judicial system that were incarcerated. 
um, the test, the state test, there's study packets. I can see how I've not personally encountered that barrier, but I can see how that might be a barrier for, for some people. Um, I work out of a recovery community organization where everybody that works there is in recovery from the director to the accountant, everybody, and all of our staff or our front desk staff are people in recovery. That's another opportunity that they have to work with individuals in recovery. Um, a lot of times we bring in people from the recovery community to conduct groups. They're all peer-led groups. So maybe if, if the certification process is not available for some people, I don't know if you guys, I think you do have recovery community organizations where people can be of service or, or conduct groups or for a while I taught yoga at the um, RCO. I think there's different ways to be of service. I um, was just, that was going to be one of my questions, <laughs> but I want to make a comment also. I, everybody, I mean, this was a, um, a very educational conference, so I'm really glad that I was able to attend. I thank you so much for coming. I, too, am a peer recovery specialist, and just to hear what you're doing there is inspired me to do more that needs to be done here, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I know I can't do it alone, and I know there's a lot of people here that familiar faces that I will able to get that help because we are not that far yet. At least I can't see that. Um, but we need to do more to do that in the prisons. My, I started off as a peer support specialist. I've been in the mental health and addiction field for 20 something years, but as a peer wearing that hat, was in 2011, and I only wish I had someone to come to me and tell me, God, I know where you're coming from, mm -hmm. you know, because of this. You know, I probably would have le been less in the hospitals, right? I recently lost two kids five months apart. But we need to, you know, there was more there. We were able to talk more, I mean, because they're, they're there longer, and they're, in my opinion, too long, from mm -hmm. a month to like, four or five months and worked in the addiction. But it was the connection that I made in uh, with the patients um, was different from what I do now where I see clients, I may not see them tomorrow. Um, you know, we're a volunteer program at Mothers First. But to be able to have that, um, because what changes what made in the hospitals or like a setting where they can't leave yet, you know, right? For they're there for a long time, is that there was at least six or seven that became peers, because I was able to get that connection with them, get them started, and so on and so on. And now they're out there working, and, and it's just fabulous. Mm -hmm. But uh, I really uh, will be taking a lot out of this conference, and I'm really glad I came. So thank I thank you. All. I'm so sorry for your loss, too. And if there's anything that I can do um, to help you, um, if you have any questions, please reach out. I'll give you my card. Just a question about employment of peers. Um, you mentioned recovery community organizations. Are treatment providers also hiring them? Like, where do people get employed as a peer recovery specialist? Is there a lot of employment? Are, you, are they people able to find it, retain it, that sort of thing? In El Paso, it's definitely grown a lot in the last few years. It's kind of exploded. Um, I know peers that are employed um, in treatment facilities. I work out of a primary um, healthcare setting. Um, I know there's places in the country where they work in emergency rooms, um, in prisons. The local mental health authority employs them in clinics. Um, we refer to ourselves as like Swiss Army knives. We, we're very multi, uh, multi-purposeful, I guess. There's a lot of settings, I think. I, um, something that Project Vida did, Dr. Hector, um, 
talked about the dearth of counselors in schools, and so Project B that identified that need in one uh, school district where there was a lot of suicides and substance use, and they put um, behavioral health providers inside of each of those schools, and I provide peer services to the students at the okay. schools. It's, it's difficult because you have to get a clearance to go into the schools, and because we are experientially um, certified, or you know, we, we, a lot of us have records. I don't, so I was able to, but um, we're trying to kind of address that barrier as well. Just a follow up. So obviously, you know, Medicaid, you just got that mm -hmm. now. And so obviously that didn't make a difference of the employment. So they were using some other sorts of funds to pay for those peers. Do you have any sense of what that is? Besides, I, you mentioned the federal grants. Is there mm -hmm. other types of funding to help support peers or is it just we were based hired on, a business? on initially through a state grants? Um, and now we have a, a SAMHSA grant. Um, I, we're hoping that the rates get better in Texas. I know that that's something that they're asking for. You know, I, I don't know. A lot of times we just have to get very creative. But we do sure. a lot of collaborating, interagency collaboration. That helps a lot as well. Sure. Or one more question. To add to, to your question, I think uh, in Pennsylvania we created a, it's like a mobile team, a peer support group, and they go, so if you, if you have a patient showing up to the ER, right, we call that, that team, and the team comes in a the, the nice van, and they take the patient, they give information, and then they make the referral. So we're helping the ER, the urgent care physicians to get them to treatment, outpatient. Because that's where the big gap is, right? You can show up to the ER, they detox you, and then what? Send you home with no treatment. And then you relapse or lapse days later. And we know the data say that those two weeks after detox are the highest risk for you to, to die from an overdose mm -hmm. or to relapse, right? So that, that peer support group, what it does, it comes to you. And that's something that's missing, right? Because it takes a lot of courage to ask for help and you correct me on this, but once the help comes to you, you're a lot more likely to, to accept that help. And so, so that's something that, that we're doing, and, and it's, it was just implemented not that long ago. I'm pretty sure 2017, 2018, yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, everyone, for your questions, and thank you, Jamie Bailey.